This is what we have. This is all we have. This moment. Let's take it. And acknowledging that, yeah, we're going to die. Someday we're going to die. But every day between now and then, we're not. Let's live. For you, for me, for us. We're here, for now. What more do you want? Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your questions and comments. In the light of day. Trying to put together these presentations, which you know I, I have been a part of before. Not to brag, folks. <laughs> <But> anyway, um, <laughs> David has hosted me a couple of times yeah. uh, in the Chicago area. Right. Uh, people have complained that you make predictions mm -hmm. with a date stamp or something, and that they don't like that. And I always try to explain to them that you're not making predictions with a date stamp. Can you maybe? you know, go a little deeper into that? Yeah, that's a great question, because sometimes I say things and I, and I say them rather firmly. For example, I just put out an Age of Extinction video clip in which I said, this is probably it. So sometimes I use strong language, like, I think this fall is probably it. The industrial civilization, the civilization we inhabit is stretched to the breaking point, and it has been for 10 years since global financial crisis, when we just papered over the whole thing. So I think this fall is probably it, but I don't know for sure. Nobody knows for sure. You don't know your own expiration date. The doctor doesn't know your expiration date. The doctor doesn't give you a day when you're going to die, when, you, when he gives you your stage four cancer terminal diagnosis. He or she says, you got six weeks, maybe 12. That's based on the evidence that he or she has looked at and compares you to other people with a similar diagnosis, and it's as good as they can do. And there's a lot of latitude between six and 12 weeks or months, by the way. So several months ago, I wrote a piece called Seven Threes, and it starts with you're looking on the horizon, you see a mushroom cloud, it looks like a nuclear blast has just detonated, and then there's a 20-foot metal I-beam, 20 feet long, coming at you, aimed right at your head, and you have three seconds to live, there's no way you can get out of the way. And then, at the last millisecond, it just skims right over your head. You don't have three seconds. The voice on the radio says, that blast is going to impact you. It's going to kill you in three, mon three minutes. Well, if you thought you had three seconds, and two and a half seconds later, you find out you have three minutes, you're like, whew! <laughs> Three minutes is forever. I'll take that every time. And if you know you have three minutes, what are you going to do? You actually have time to do things. You can call somebody on the phone. You could write a love note. You could do all kinds of things in three minutes. Extend that to three hours. If you thought you had three minutes to live, and then you find out you have three hours to live, imagine the places you can go. I mean... Maybe not physically go, but you can do a lot of, and, and so on up till three years. And if you think that you're going to die today, if you live as if this is your final day on earth, and you end up getting an extra two years, the gratitude is incredible. Every moment, every moment becomes sweeter because it might be your last. If you live with death over your left shoulder, if you live with urgency, if you live with intention, if you live with gratitude, and then you get more moments, that's not such a bad thing. So I make these strong statements to answer your question. Almost never are they predictions, although they're commonly interpreted that way, mostly because, I hate to say this, but this is a, this is a really smart group, I can tell. So you probably know this already. People are stupid. <laughs> I mean, really, I say these things, and people twist them and turn them around, and I didn't even say that, but that's the, the thing I say becomes this other thing that is then turned against me. It happens all the time, and it happens to you all the time, too. That's how the whole game of telephone gets started, right? 
you tell her and she tells him and he tells her and she tells me and geez, you're the worst person on the planet, man. I can't believe you said that. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I'm just wondering if you could speak at all to how carbon dioxide, how methane plays into the carbon dioxide level. Yeah, so the question is, how does methane relate to or play into the carbon dioxide issue? So, when James Hansen testified before Congress in 1988, he indicated that when humans came into being on the planet, there was about 280 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 280. And at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we were about 320. And so he, he identified somewhere between three, 320 and 350 as being the upper limit beyond which we would enter horrible times with more than 320 to 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're now at more than 400 parts per million. And based on a paper in the February 2009 issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, we are locked into the temperature associated with 400 plus parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for at least the next thousand years. There's a lag before the temperature increases based only on 385 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've locked in a six degree Celsius global average temperature rise. That'll take a while. How does this relate to methane? Methane, or CH4, is more than 100 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, molecule for molecule. So every molecule of CH4, which is a primary component in natural gas, is more than 100 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than every molecule of CO2. So for every part per billion of methane, which is how methane is measured, is in parts per billion, that's worth 100 parts per billion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So currently we're just over 400, about 410 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're at more than 2,000 parts per billion methane in the atmosphere, which is equivalent to more than 200 parts per million equivalent of carbon dioxide. So if we just add up those two greenhouse gases and be conservative, 400 parts per million CO2, and the CO2 equivalent of 200 more parts from the methane, we're at 600 parts per million equivalent carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And 350 is unsafe. 350 is too much. And by the way, 350.org, heavily funded by the Rockefellers, knew at the time they did their first public demonstration in the fall of 2009 that 350 was unsafe and that we can never get back to the temperature associated with the then level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, about 380 parts per million. Great question, thank you. Yes? Can you elaborate what you said about like there's, once we cut off all uh, energy consumption on Earth, we have like a 35% increase in temperature. Can you, can you elaborate? Yeah, so the question is, can you elaborate on the, the global dimming phenomenon or the aerosol masking effect? I think that's what you're asking about. Sure. Yeah, so once, <laughs> once we stop burning fossil fuels, after a relatively short lag, the aerosols, mostly sulfates, associated with burning fossil fuels, and especially coal, and especially unclean coal that has a lot of sulfur in it, once we stop burning coal, the sulfates associated with burning coal start falling out of the atmosphere. Well, they're always falling out of the atmosphere, really. And we're just burning so much coal that we're putting more aerosols up into the atmosphere. So this, this effect is sometimes called global dimming and sometimes called the aerosol masking effect. And what the global dimming does, what the aerosol masking effect does, is it masks what would be an even higher global average temperature if it weren't for the particulates that we're putting up into the atmosphere. So they serve as something of an umbrella. We know about greenhouse gases that retain long-wave radiation 
and therefore, therefore heat up the planet by trapping that long wave radiation. So Earth has become like a greenhouse on wheels that your car is. Right? It heats up there when it's in the parking lot on a summer day. You come out and all that long wave radiation is trapped in there. And it's, un it's miserably hot to get into your car on a summer day when the windows have been up. And that's what we've done with planet Earth. But now imagine that your car has been sitting there in the parking lot, but it had a shade over it the whole time. So it's been in the shade, and still it gets hotter than it is outside. Still it gets hotter because some of that, some of those greenhouse gases get trapped in there. It still heats up. Imagine what it would be like without the shade. If you had to park out in the driveway instead of in the carport every day or in the garage. That's what we're facing. And unlike in your car when you pull out of the carport or pull out from under the, the shade cover and in two minutes it heats up or cools down, we're talking about about six weeks for all the particulates to fall out of the sky. And we keep putting them up there. They're constantly falling out, but we're putting them up there just as fast as they're falling out or even faster. <coughs> Once we stop, once we turn off the switch of industrial civilization, even at a relatively small level, even at the level of 35% of the industrial activity, as little as 35% of the industrial activity, which is what, maybe China or the United States or Europe, they, they each account for roughly 30 or so percent of the economy of the world. And so we get up there in the neighborhood of turning those off and the planet heats up very rapidly as a consequence. So it's really a there's, there's nothing to be done situation, right? So we either maintain the omnicide that is this set of living arrangements, you know, where we continue to kill other species and we continue to kill other people for what we deem is our oil. We keep doing that. We keep burning fossil fuels and heating the planet. That's horrible enough. And if we stop doing it, the situation from, a, from the planetary perspective of global warming spins out of control almost immediately. So we can't stop. We're dead if we don't stop, and we're dead if we stop. It looks like we're dead men walking. Women, too. So I guess what you're telling some of these younger folks up in front of me is that it's irreversible? It's, we're absolutely in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. Yes. No cure. What's that? No cure. No, there's no cure. We're in stage four cancer. Nobody lives. And I'm not happy about this. I'm not only unhappy to be the guy bringing you this message, because you can't even imagine how many hate mail messages I've received in the hour I've been talking with you, much less all damn day. <laughs> but I don't want to die either. We expect our parents to die before we do. That's the way it's supposed to work. That's the way it's always worked. Every generation is supposed to benefit and be better off than the previous generation. That's the American ideal. That's what we always hear. Not this time. We're in the midst of abrupt climate change, and there's precedence for such phenomenon in the paleoecological record with, a, as I indicated, PT, PETM, the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum, when the global average temperature rose 5 degrees C in 13 years. So we know this can happen. Earth's sensitivity is amazingly high, and particularly when we look at things like the sulfates and them falling out of the atmosphere and the planet warming up in a span of six weeks, even if that's six months, that's less than a growing season. Plants can't adapt to that. Plants can't pick up and move. Oh man, it's getting too hot down here in the tropics. I'm going to go up north. No, that doesn't happen that way. And if plants can't move, we don't survive. And the plants can't keep up with that rate of change. And I don't want to die either, but I don't see any way around this. Yes? methane situation. Can you explain um, where methane comes from or the largest 
Where the largest source of methane can come from? Yeah, the two primary sources of methane that we hear the most about and that probably accounts for the largest abundance of methane on Earth are permafrost. Permafrost contains a tremendous amount of methane and carbon dioxide. And the permafrost is melting all over the globe. You know, you just need to look on YouTube over the course of the last year or so, and you can say tremendous areas where the earth just slides down a hill and that all used to be permafrost that used to be permanently frozen in other words and now it looks like pudding sliding down the hill and off-gassing pressurized methane and carbon dioxide the other primary source of methane is in the relatively shallow seabed of the arctic ocean and that's one one of a few reasons that the president of Finland is going around saying if we lose the ice over the Arctic Ocean, we lose habitat for humans. Because there have been a couple of studies that came out in 2007 with a dozen authors on each study, Nature Communications and I don't remember the journal where the other one was. Both of them in 2017, completely different set of authors, a dozen authors on each paper and concluding that there has been a tremendous release of methane from the relatively shallow seafloor in the past, and so therefore we can expect that kind of release in the future in the absence of ice over the Arctic Ocean. One of the leading authorities on the topic is Natalia Shikova and her research team, and they described a 50 gigaton burst of methane as being highly possible at any time, that was late in 2008 at the European Geophysical Union meetings. And Shikova and Hall were the names on the paper, one of the two papers in 2017, that provides ample support for that idea. So those are the two major sources of methane that are out there hovering. And at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, methane was about 750 parts per billion in the atmosphere. 750 parts per billion in the atmosphere, equivalent to 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in terms of the 1750 baseline. So 280 parts per million carbon dioxide, 750 parts per billion of methane. Now the methane, some days, it's measured with satellite observations and also with direct flask measurements. Some days it's up around 3,000 parts per billion. And for the last few years, it's been routinely above 2,000 parts per billion. So that's an enormous number compared to 750 parts per billion. Just as more than 400 parts per million CO2 is an enormous number compared to 280 at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I, I get tired of uh, environmental groups, uh, NGOs, you know, grassroots organizations, present, they present this, this horrifying story about climate change, right? And then the, the, uh, the tagline at the end is, uh, but it's not too late. And I find that tremendously insulting to my intelligence because after all the evidence is presented, your only logical conclusion is, yeah, it's too late, and you just insulted my intelligence by telling me because they want you to renew your membership, go to a march on Washington, write letters to your congressman, make phone calls, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so what you're, at least you're leveling with us and being honest. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you that we hear all the time from these conservation organizations, the nonprofit industrial complex, that the situation is really dire and we need to do these four things and the, the one thing that leads the list every time it sends us money. There's no amount of money that could fix this. If any amount of money could fix this, we would fix it. Because where does money come from? The Federal Reserve System prints the damn stuff. Same for the European Union. It comes out of thin air, that's where money comes from. If it was a matter of money, we would have fixed this a long time ago. But in fact, there's a lot of money to be made by not fixing abrupt climate change. So I suspect that's why we're not doing much to quote, fix it, that, and the fact that it's 
actually a predicament, it's not a problem. Problems have solutions. You can find problems in a math book. And then you flip to the back of the math book and there's the answers right there. Oh look, 42. Always 42. Hitchhiker's Guide, readers take note. This is a predicament. This is insoluble. We can't fix this. It's a predicament. We can either maintain the omnicidal heat engine known as civilization, or we can turn it off. And if we maintain it, we're all dead. And if we turn it off, we're all dead faster. How are we going to fix that? That said, there are many things we can do every day in our personal lives that will make our lives better and also the lives of the people that we come into contact with. Let's do those things. And by the way, if you want to support your local nonprofit organization or your national or international nonprofit organization, that's fine with me. If you want to write to your congressman, I don't think it's going to do any harm. I'll, I'll retain my sense of cynicism for the for the assembled here. It might not do much good, but I don't think it'll do any harm, and that's what we're supposed to do, right? First, do no harm. So write those letters, call your congress critter. Tell them what you really think. It's not going to hurt. It might even make you feel good about yourself. Go to the march. And when you go to the march, and you bump into other people who are serious about climate change and they want to make the world a better place, go up and ask them about global dimming. Do you know about global dimming? None of them will. So you can inform them. And that'll make you, not me, the least popular person at the march. <laughs> So that'll be a nice change. Yes, Deb? Okay, I think you said uh, you expect we might have an ice-free Arctic this next month. Have you said that? I, and actually, my question is, whenever it happens, do you see a scenario of how things would unfold once that happens with the environment and the crops? Right, right. So I think it was in July when I read a projection indicating, so this was a projection on July 6th, indicating that we would have an ice free Arctic within 20 days, July 26th, my brother's birthday. And I thought, what a nice birthday present. And I didn't really. And it didn't happen. So the projection was based on a, a given melt rate that they projected into the future and July, as it turns out, was a pretty cool month. One of the coolest Julys in the last couple of decades. And I suspect a reason for that is because there's so much smoke all over the planet, the world's literally on fire. So it's just like it was 66 million years ago when the oil field caught on fire. We've got a bunch of particulates up there blocking the sun from getting in. Ain't wildfires great? So they may, in fact, be cooling the planet enough to slow down the melt rate. So the latest projection I've seen, which was last week, indicates that we're going to get down to only about 4 million square kilometers of ice extent in the Arctic Ocean, which is four times as much as a million. Not even close to zero. So I think we're going to make it through this year. 2016 plus or minus three years from that paper in the in your review of Earth and Planetary Sciences, it looks like we're going to skate through 2018 and still have significant ice on the Arctic Ocean. So I was premature in my expectation, which was not a prediction, as indicated when, when I answered Dave's question earlier. It looks like we're going to skate through, and I couldn't be happier about that, by the way. Because at this point, another year, for me, is like another lifetime. Exactly. You know, again, if you only get three seconds and then you find out it's three minutes, oh, wow. And then you find out you've got another year. Now, it could be that the House of Cards comes down from a financial perspective and the associated reduction in global dimming causes the temperature to rise. But, but, so, but it looks like there won't be a physical factor involving Arctic ice that causes the collapse of civilization due to global average temperature rise. It looks like that's not going to happen. And I'm ecstatic about that. People write to me every day and they say, how does it feel to be right? 
it's clear we're going extinct. And I think, i got to stop carrying that scythe with me when I walk down the street. Are you kidding? How does it feel to be right? It feels horrible. It feels horrible. I don't want everybody to die. I don't even want me to die. Kind of indifferent about you, but that, you know, we just met. What do you expect? I'm happy I got another three minutes. <laughs> so. Yeah, but guys, so once the ice melts, then what's the sequence? I don't. Okay, know. right. Sorry. Sometimes, you know, I tell apocalypse jokes like there's no tomorrow. So sometimes I forget what the question was. So thanks for reining me back in. So what happens? Well, as I indicated earlier, James Hansen's legal brief filed in August three years ago indicates that we've had humans on the planet up to about 2C above the 1750 baseline. We're currently at 1.73 degrees above the 1750 baseline, and we started triggering the self-reinforcing feedback loops a long time ago. What happens with an ice-free Arctic? Several of those increase very rapidly and very abruptly. For example, just consider these three. One, we lose the albedo. So we lose the white cap, which reflects sunlight back into space. A blue ocean event, as it's often called, the BOE, blue ocean event means that we lose all that reflectance and instead we have a blue ocean, a dark body absorbing the heat. And it was just, what, two or three weeks ago the Washington Post ran an article describing the Arctic Ocean as the Atlantic Ocean because they're interfingering. It's, it's all coming together now. The Arctic Ocean is warming up so fast that biologists are observing species that have never before been seen in the Arctic Ocean that are coming up from the Atlantic or Ocean. So, you know, and big stuff too, like sharks that are not supposed to be doing that because the Arctic is already getting warm. Well, if we lose the ice cap, it's going to get warm way faster. Second point is methane release. Shkova and colleagues, Sarov and colleagues, in those two papers in 2017, you can find all this information at my blog, gamingperson.com. If we get just a, a single gigaton burst of methane, a single 50 gigaton burst of methane, as described by Shkova and colleagues in late 2008, that would very rapidly warm the planet by 1.3 degrees Celsius, according to Shukova and colleagues. And that takes us up to three, more than three degrees. So we've had humans at two. And the change occurs so quickly that the growing seasons don't mean anything anymore. And already they're falling apart. If you follow the news at all, and two things to notice. Listen for all the descriptions of bizarre weather events, like thousand-year floods every year. And then listen for the words climate change, almost never mentioned by the corporate media. So the world's on fire, and there's no mention of climate change almost ever. So the second thing is we get this, almost certainly get this tremendous methane burp that heats the planet very quickly. The third thing is, called latent heat. So you, you take your glass of your favorite beverage and it's half ice and it's half beverage at a party and you walk around and as long as there's a little sliver of ice, the temperature of that beverage is just about zero degrees Celsius. It's just about freezing. And it lasts for an hour or two if you don't drink it so damn fast. As soon as that last little sliver of ice is gone, the, the liquid heaps up very, very quickly. Because it was taking 79.2 calories of energy to melt a single gram of ice into a single milliliter of water, 79.2 calories for the phase change. And once the phase change occurs, you put that same 79.2 calories into that now liquid milliliter of water, and it heats up to 79.2 degrees Celsius, which is scalding hot. Scalding hot. So once we get rid of the ice in the Arctic, a whole series of self-reinforcing feedback loops accelerate, 
and lead to a planet that is very abruptly too warm for human existence. Not the same day, not even the same week. When the Arctic's gone, when the Arctic ice is gone, it's not that everybody's going to keel over 12 minutes later. But it won't be long before what we have on Earth is a few sociopaths living in bunkers for a few more years. But it's, you know, we're, we're creating essentially a dead planet, just like with the previous mass extinction events. And this one is worse because when civilization fails, we have the catastrophic meltdown of more than 450 nuclear power plants around the world, and then the ionizing radiation strips the atmosphere away and leaves Earth like a lifeless Mars-style rock floating through space with six sociopaths living in bunkers. <laughs> the last of them dies surrounded by the bodies of like-minded sociopaths when he runs out of peaches in a can. I don't want that to be me. That's a personal thing. I used to want to be that person. Back when I, when I thought about linear climate change, this sort of Al Gore inconvenient truth, we can fix this style of climate change, when I was moving to my off-grid existence in New Mexico 10 or 12 years ago, I thought that's what's going to happen. I'm going to outlive everybody. I'm going to be the last person on Earth because I had canned peaches. <laughs> And then, as knowledge about abrupt climate change came to the fore, and the acknowledgement that we're in the sixth mass extinction, and those nuclear power plants all melting down, then suddenly I wasn't so gung-ho about being the last person on Earth. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun, to be honest. Then you won't even know. The last person on Earth won't know that they're the last person on Earth. They'll be in this bunker surrounded by the bodies of like-minded sociopaths and empty cans of peaches. But there might be another person in a bunker the next ridge over you don't know. All you know is you have a lot of time to read. <laughs> Nobody's bothering you anymore. Nobody's calling on the phone. You aren't getting 300 email messages a day like I am. It just seems really calm. And then you run out of peaches and that's it. And I love canned peaches, I really do. It's like one of my favorite things. I mean, not compared to ice cream. Let's, let's get serious here. Yeah, David. Um, this is a, a question that kind of leads into what you're talking about. A few years back, you mentioned that a person had contacted you in regards to, you know, abrupt climate change and all the rest of it. And you never mentioned his name up until a few years ago. And he wanted to know where would be the best place on earth to go to, and you said New Zealand or something. But now, over the past couple of years, you started mentioning his name. And I'm just wondering, what changed your mind about mentioning his name? And I think it was Steve Wozniak. Yeah, Steve Wozniak. Most of you know who Steve Wozniak is. He single-handedly built the Apple I and Apple II computers. He was one of the three founders of Apple. And he contacted me a month after I gave my first public presentation about abrupt climate change and human extinction in the relatively near term. And so he contacts me a month later, December 2012. And, and first of all, I didn't believe it was him. Because I don't know about you, but I don't get a lot of email from Steve Wozniak. Or as I call my buddy now, the Woz. And so I sent him, I sent him a series of questions asking, is this really you? as if he would lie once, but then not the next time. <laughs> anyway, and I didn't, give a, I didn't reveal his name for two years because it took him two years to move. And so this was privileged information that he was about to move to the Southern Hemisphere, so I didn't want to give that out. Right? It was just a private email message between me and him. It wasn't for me to say, Steve Wozniak believes me, neener, neener, and so he's moving, and he ended up moving to Tasmania, the Southern Island state of Australia. And this is before we understand, understood the radical impact of global dimming on Earth. It was before that, so it seemed like a good idea at the time. Well, the Waz hates to fly. 
And he loved his life. You know, he voluntarily taught elementary school kids in Silicon Valley. And he would go and he'd interact with these kids. And he was perfectly content with the relatively small amount of money he had. According to Wikipedia, he's only worth $100 million. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a lot for me, don't get me wrong. But for the, for the kinds of folks he hangs out with, that's not an enormous amount of money. He's not Jeff Bezos. You know, he can't just buy the Washington Post on a whim. So I asked him for a couple of favors, relatively minor things, I thought, because, I mean, because of my work, he turned his life upside down. He and his fourth wife, Janet, moved to Tasmania, moved all the way across the planet so that he could live a little bit longer. And at the time, I was thinking that down close to Antarctica, before we knew about global dimming, before it was recognized that we were in the sixth mass extinction, I was thinking he had 10 or 15 years longer if he moved down there. Now I think he might have 10 or 15 minutes, maybe even days or weeks. But, but I don't see there being a big difference now between this living close to Antarctica and living in the tropics. So I've changed my mind about that over the course of the last nearly six years because the evidence has become more compelling in pointing out that for all practical purposes, we're going to lose habitat for all of us on the globe pretty much the same time in the near future. Now that said, there's a lot of people who have already lost habitat. Middle East and Northern Africa, Southern islands in the, in the South Pacific, indigenous communities in Alaska are losing habitat because the lack of ice is causing the waves to erode away the beach and so all the homes are falling into the ocean. So habitat is already being lost around the planet. A friend of mine is a medical doctor in Toronto, but she's from Germany. And she, she buried her father today. And she attributes his death to abrupt climate change. He was in Germany, and in Germany they've never needed air conditioning in their hospitals because it doesn't get that hot. And it became too hot to cool him, so he died. And she acknowledges that this is the first of probably a few or many people, depending on how fast it happens, that she will lose from her life because of climate change. You will never see that reported in the corporate media that he died from climate change. Just like you'll never see in the corporate media all these fires in the West being a result of climate change or even being influenced by climate change. Likewise for the floods. Likewise for everything else that's happening. But if abrupt climate change is not a contributor to habitat loss, and somebody can demonstrate that conclusively, I will eat this sock. This one. This one right here. It's on video now. <laughs> so there's already a lot of things happening in the world. If you're paying attention at all, you know about it. The people who I see on tour who come up to me and say, it's happening, are the people who work outdoors. They're foresters, they're gardeners, they're people who are working outdoors a lot. And they can tell. Because they don't get two cuttings of kale, they get none. They no longer have cherry trees that are early, mid, and late season. They get no cherries at all because they all burned up before the early cherries were done. So if you're paying attention, you know what's happening. Phyllis? Well, could you talk about the effects of just heat alone without talking about habitat loss and not just the rising temperatures and what effect that has on our life? Yeah, so just rising temperatures, what kind of impact, impact does that have on our life? Never mind habitat. Well, first, I want to tie it to habitat. At about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, photosynthesis stops. 104 degrees Fahrenheit, about 40 or 41 degrees Celsius, photosynthesis stops. So there's a lot of weed out there that can be devastated by two or three days of really high temperatures. And so that gets, again, at habitat, at our ability to eat food. But in terms of heat and its direct effects on the body, there's something called the lethal wet bulb temperature. When I was a firefighter and then a fire lighter back in my youth, 
we would spin a device called a psychrometer and it would have two thermometers on it and one of the thermometers was covered with a linen sock and dipped in distilled water. And depending upon how dry it was, it evaporated. The water evaporated off of that linen sock. And so there was a big temperature difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb. A lethal wet bulb temperature occurs when the temperature is at 95 degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity is at 100% or some combination of higher temperature and lower relative humidity. So once it gets to 95 degrees and 100% humidity as it does seemingly every day where I live in Belize, the body can no longer dump heat fast enough to keep up with internal heating. The body is physiologically incapable because we're warm-blooded organisms, we're homeothermic organisms. We cannot dump heat fast enough to keep up with our own heat creation that happens from being alive. And so at 100 degrees, and I don't know what the number is, 85 or 90% relative humidity, six hours, even if you're standing in front of a fan, six hours later you're dead. And that's because of organ failure. That's what results from lethal wet bulb temperatures is organ failure. And the symptoms, and I've been doing a lot of research on this kind of thing, the symptoms include researching symptoms and treatments. The symptoms include, and I think this will be a major cause of human mortality in the very near future in Belize where I live, at 17 degrees north latitude. Symptoms include things like people act like they're drunk, they exhibit poor judgment. They lose their balance. So when I see somebody at 11 o'clock in the morning and we're pounding nails shoulder to shoulder, although to be fair, almost nobody pounds nails next to me shoulder to shoulder because they know better than that. Because I'm not all that good with a hammer. And after I hit that one guy, everybody gets upset. You know? <laughs> anyway, so when, and we've seen this with the people on the property in Belize. People start tripping. People start falling over and, and exhibiting poor judgment because they're in the early stages of organ failure. So we get them out of the sun and put them in the, in the pool or put them in the shower where they can get cold water because these are the ways that our body can actually dump heat. We can't do it just by blowing air across ourselves. So I suspect that will be a leading cause of human mortality in the years ahead especially in light of the rapid loss of global dimming when industrial activity slows or stops. And for the most part, people won't know what's happening, and that's one of the primary reasons I'm doing this tonight and why I do this so frequently, is I want people to know what's happening. Even if you're all going to die, and you are, even if we are all going to die, and we are, even if you're in stage four cancer and you're out there working a construction project and everybody around you is exhibiting terrible behavior and, and you know you're gonna die as a result, I still wanna know. Call me crazy, but even if the people around me are all going to die, and they are, I'd like to know what's happening when it's happening. I'd like to know what the symptoms are of dehydration, starvation, wet bulb temperatures. The things that we can forecast are likely to occur to the people in our lives. Even if we can't help, even if we can't help, at least we'll know and there will be a sense of, or the ability for intellectual calm, psychological calm, because we know what's happening. Most of us have had a pet die, and if the pet gets really old, we know that the, that the, the dog or the cat is gonna die at some point, it's not gonna be too long from now, and therefore when, when that pet of ours slips away into the final night of forever sleep, at least being intellectually prepared is useful. We're not really good at surprises. 
Nobody likes that kind of surprise. So one of the primary reasons I'm doing this is to remind people of something they knew since they were 12. That birth is a sexually transmitted disease that is proven fatal in every case. Yeah? On top of methane trapped in permafrost, is uh, pathogens also a large risk, if not larger, than the heat? You know, I was warning about pathogens. The question is, um, aren't pathogens likely to be a significant contributor to human lethality in the future, as well as methane? And absolutely. And you don't have to look very far in the news these days to find pathogens that have been unearthed, that have been released by a thawing circumboreal region for the first time in 40 years, 60 years, 400 years, that kind of thing. So the latest thing is there's all these crazy worms that are coming out. And before that it was, what was it? Anthrax, right. It was anthrax coming from the bodies of, of organisms, mostly elk and deer, that died during World War II, right? And so it's, it's, and caribou, that's right, thank you. And so there are all these pathogens that are emerging. I was, I was teaching this in my classes as one of the likely impacts of global warming, global climate change, 20 years ago in my classes. And it's starting to, to appear now. It's being manifest everywhere. There are all these pathogens that are jumping up. And, and again, it's one of those cases that there's so many different, there's so many different ways to die. It's really pretty interesting, isn't it? <laughs> and, and again, we don't know. We don't know when we're going to draw our last breath. We don't know what's going to kill us. And it could be any of a dozen things. It could be nuclear war at this point. It wouldn't surprise me at all. After all, the sociopaths pulling the strings of empire know what I know. My work is freely available. So they know when the, when the Arctic ice is looking like it's on its last legs, they know that there's really no great risk associated with launching nuclear weapons all over. It might actually cool the planet for another year or two. And another year or two is a long time, as I've already described. Another year or two compared to another week? That's forever. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to recommend arson for anybody. <laughs> not when the camera's running. We can talk later. <laughs> yeah, Kurt. Well, I, I understand that there's some um, masking effect from the forest fires, but that carbon is all, always being released too. And my question to you, though, is the carbon that was released when you turned on those lights, a little, little bit of carbon came out of the smokestack up in, up in west in there. Uh, I've heard different numbers on how long it takes for that carbon to reach its maximum effect. I know it's going to be there affecting things for a thousand years or more, but how, is it 40 years or how long before, you know, if we, right. the stuff that's doing it now was released like 40 years ago, right? So the question is, what's the point at which the carbon dioxide released today? reaches its maximum level of heating capacity. And we thought, based on a paper in Skeptical Science from several years ago, that it was a 40-year lag. That from the time we turn on the light switch and release that little bit of carbon dioxide until it maximally heated the planet was 40 years. And then there's a refereed journal article that came out three or four years ago. And all this is at the long essay, Climate Change Summary and Update it. Guy McPherson.com, indicating that it's 10 years, 10 years plus or minus. So we know that, the, that we're experiencing the maximum heat from carbon dioxide today from carbon dioxide that really was released 10 years ago, plus or minus a couple of years, because it's scientific um, standard deviations put on these numbers. But it's basically 10 years, plus or minus a few. So there is a lag between when we turn on the switch, when we fire up the internal combustion engine, when we burn the, the, fire, the forests in the Pacific Northwest before the lag is produced. There's a very short lag associated with the global dimming impact, a matter of days or weeks, and a much longer lag before the maximum heating is observed. And a shorter lag with methane? 
methane's half-life is much shorter than that of carbon dioxide, yes. And so we experience the heat faster, and we experience the absence of feeding faster, the absence of methane. The good news, bad news is that methane breaks down relatively quickly. That's the good news. The bad news is it breaks down into carbon dioxide and water, two leading greenhouse gases. Aren't I a lot of fun? I'll stop right there. I'll stay as long as you'd like to talk with you individually, but people are starting to filter out and everybody has other things to do tonight. So thank you again very much for coming. I very much appreciate it.